Muhammad Ali wrote that poem about I am the greatest heavyweight champion the world has ever seen. When you go and listen to it, he wrote that eight months before he became heavyweight champion at age 22. Eight months before. Okay, guys, welcome back. Today's guest is a speaker, author, and business architect who has been featured in Forbes magazine, Huffington Post, Wealth Insider, Mentor Box, and so many more. After losing over a million dollars in bad business, poor decisions, and investments that didn't turn out how he expected, plus having three of his businesses lose over $100,000 each in the space of a year, leaving him completely frustrated and exhausted, he decided to make a change. He spent over 20,000 hours studying the masters of the game when it comes to business, such as Tony Robbins, Russell Brunson, Jay Abraham, and so many more. He has then since gone on to do over $300 million in sales in his businesses and has mentored over 100 high-level entrepreneurs from over four different continents. So please help me welcome the guy who went from weeding his neighbor's gardens at age 13 to now a famous entrepreneur who you're about to hear all about, who is impacting millions of people all around the world with his work by helping individuals find their inner genius and personal gift to live a life of freedom. And now the author of The Genius Within, my friend all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, Mr. Mike Zella. Morgan, excited to dive in, my man. Good, good to see you and uh, and and finally do this. We've been trying to make this happen for 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 a bit, and um, I'm really excited. I mean, I was I was looking through your your website, your bio, your everything before we did this episode, and I was just like, whoa, I I want to do more than one episode of this guy. There's just so much information here, so many things you've done, so many things you've accomplished. Um, so I'm really really excited. So I'd love to first dive in. You know, you've accomplished some incredible stuff. Um, and one of the things you're also talking about in, in, on your website and, and the things you're doing is, you know, you've also gone through these adversities and these failures and, and you've really learned by screwing things up along the way, which I think is super important. So I'll, I really want to first find out from you along your journey of, you know, now doing over $300 million in sales is mm -hmm. what was some of the biggest things that went wrong and how, if you knew what you knew now, how would you pivot otherwise? We might need five podcasts to go through yeah, all the I things so, that I've right? made, made mistakes in and done wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, couple, I mean, you know, ultimately, I made a lot of decisions. The first things, uh, I made a lot of decisions that were right. But also, if you make, you know, it's a lot easier to burn a house down than it is to build it. You can burn a house down with a single wrong decision. Um, and one of the biggest wrong decisions I made as an entrepreneur that I made multiple times. Um, and that's part of like, sometimes I'm a stubborn, I'm a, like a stubborn mule. You have to kind of bang it in my head before I finally like, Oh, there's something there. Oh, I should write a book about it because I've screwed it up too many times <laughs> before. But uh, it's mostly uh, one of the biggest things you can go almost anywhere and accomplish almost anything. If you have the right team. That's so why Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, says, first who, then what? And when I looked around my businesses, part of the reason for my success, part of the reason for all the growth at different points was the who, but also part of the reason for the fall was the who. I didn't surround myself with the right operating partners at times. I surrounded myself with good people, that, good people, period, in general, but, and people that were growth oriented but I, if, if I looked at how I assembled, like, you know, I don't know if you're a sports fan. I'm a big sports fan. And you look at sports, there's, it's a microcosm. It's a reflection, an easy reflection for what happens in business. But it's, uh, if you get the right team, build a dream team, you have the right people playing the right roles and their strengths, but they're in their zone of genius and you're in your zone of genius. Guess what? You can do a lot of great things and you can be mm -hmm. unstoppable. Yeah. So I, I blundered a few bit, a few moments on the uh, operating partners, especially. Yeah. So, okay. So, cause this is so interesting because um, I'm learning a lot about this right now as well as I'm really focusing now on building my traditional business. I've been an events company, online coaching and training and stuff like this. So how, how does one, 
how, how do you identify other people's, I guess, genius zones and then putting the right people in the right places? Yeah, I think all of life gives us clues. And that's one of the biggest things I, I started noticing is, is it's not one area, it's all of life. And if, if, if you start looking at it, clues in four sectors is, is what I've found so far. And I'll continue to revise and add to it because I know there's things I've missed out on. But first, your unique talents. You know, where are you naturally freaking amazing? And then where do you just suck? Where are you just awful? <laughs> We all have those areas. I've got enough of those areas and creating wisdom and honesty around that in organizations and uh, business and romantic relationships, just owning it, not dancing around it. Um, but man, and, and then the other part is you got to know your strengths and manage your weaknesses. And then the second area, when you've got your talents down, your unique talents, I have people go through five different personality tests. Why five? They all measure something different. Like wealth dynamics is the only test that shows you your natural pathway for building wealth. Then uh, strengths finder, Colby index, uh, disc profile, Myers-Briggs, all other tests I take. And then Enneagram is a great bonus one. But then you also look at your defining life moments. Like if I got to know Morgan uh, more deeply, I bet there's moments, pivotal moments throughout your life, both of failures, of successes, of pain, of sorrow, of joy, of like, oh, wow, maybe I'm made for this as well. Something good happened, right? Like yeah. there's, you know, that's why you asked the question, what, what, what did you do at the beginning of your life? Or were there clues? Like you see some of these successful entrepreneurs, they were selling like lemonade at age two and loving it, right? Yeah. So what was your first job, by the way? Uh, my first, my first, so there's a funny thing. So the first way I ever made money was when we were kids, I think I probably would have been about, maybe 10. Um, mm -hmm. There's this thing that was going around when I was 10. So if people listening, you might remember it. They're called Scoobies. And they're like this, you get these little bits of nylon string and you watch these videos or read these books and they show you how to like, it's almost like you plait them and you make this cool little key ring out of this little bit of nylon. And so me and my sister used to sit down and should show me how to do it, right? It's a super girly thing, right? I was like, this is kind of cool. We got kind of good at it. And then I had all these key rings. So I was like, well, what do I do with them now? So I started door knocking and selling them to all the neighbors for like 50 cents, right? Yeah. And then I come across one of the other neighbors and their kids were also making them. But except mm. these kids were really good, way better than mine. So then I asked them, I said, well, how much are you selling yours for? So I used all of my money that I collect so far. I bought all of theirs and then I took them up to the shops and I bought and I sold them for about $5 a piece. So I bought them for, mm. off them for about a dollar a piece, sold them all for $5. And then when they caught on that I was doing that, next when I saw them up at the shop selling that theirs as well. So that was the first <laughs> thing we, we kind of did. And then, and then I actually, when I was selling them at the shops, I saw just like someone collecting the shopping carts and doing all that. And I went and asked him, I was like, how do you get this job? I want to make money. And I met his boss and then I lied about my age. <laughs> she gave me a job for cash and I was up there by myself friday night collecting trolley carts when i was about 12 years old just for i think 50 bucks a week or something <laughs> yeah i do love that so you just gave me a bunch of clues i picked up on all right you're probably pretty resourceful you don't like to you don't care about the rules you'll bend the rules to fit your reality and what you want right yeah <laughs> you think rules are made for other people <laughs> yeah all right and that, so that's uh, and i could probably you know, there's some different personality tests that would indicate that. Then you look at your defined life moments, you had a victory, you had success, and you probably found some joy in that creative endeavor of like coming up with these ideas and, and, uh, you know, markup of 500%. You're like, Oh, this really works. People buy. Right. And so, so, that, you know, you look at defining life moments, there's clues littered throughout our lives. The problem is most of us have never organized our clues scattered, scattered all across our life, sc scattered all across our days. And we don't know because we, we don't have a trained eye or a trained ear, or our antenna is not turned on. Then the third thing, you look at your key relationships, who brings you life versus who brings you death? Who would you love to talk to? Like there's a, you know, as a podcast host, you pretty much get to talk to the people you want to talk to, right? Yeah. You're not talking to boring, you know, you know, grandma building her quit quilting empire, right? Unless yeah. there is a really interesting grandma that makes a lot of quilts, you're probably not going to bring her on 
to uh, your podcast. You're talking about two interesting people for you that expand, enrich, challenge you. Um, so that's a clue. Um, like I noticed also where you want to look at the clusters of relationships. I noticed, hey, I had all these amazing authors as friends. But I hadn't written a book yet. I was in the real estate game. I didn't really want to spend time with the real estate agents that much. I wanted to spend a lot of time with the authors, with the creators, with people or the people doing more than just real estate. Right. And the last thing, your values and passions, what do you stand for? What do you stand against? What are you insatiably curious about? You know, that also gives you a clue. What could I keep learning and studying? And I'm fascinated with you look at uh, uh, human psychology. And when we step into flow state, here's the other crazy thing. Have you studied flow much, Morgan? A little bit. It's the thing that's been on my mind last kind of six months. I, I started reading that book, um, Ikigai. Have you read that one? Okay. I'm familiar yeah. with it. I haven't read it. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's funny because the book's called Ikigai, but it says it actually talks about nearly everything else other than the Ikigai. But one of the parts about <laughs> it is that flow state. And I found that quite uh, fascinating, but I'd love for mm -hmm. you to dive in a bit more. Yeah, so flow state uh, was coined by uh, this guy, Mikhailovitz. I have no idea how to say his name. <laughs> name. It's like this long, super, super long name that is hard to pronounce. But he created this, this, or found out in psychological research that there's this state of mind where work becomes play and we almost become locked in the zone. So you think of, all right, what's uh, athletes? We, we get locked in the zone. In business, we sometimes get uh, locked in the zone. And when you're in this zone state, guess what? You're 500% more productive. Wow. And work becomes play and you're just boom. Well, what's the predicator? My, my quest is understanding human psychology and peak performance. You know, I've studied, uh, read 2000 books at this point, uh, spent 1,447 hours with Tony Robbins. Guess what? you're tw almost twice as likely to step into flow state when you are playing at, from your strengths. So the key then is if I wanna be in flow state and I wanna be insanely productive and effective with my life, know myself, know my genius. And then it goes back to ancient wisdom. Socrates said, to know thyself is the beginning of all wisdom. Yeah. So the things, so is, is this the, cause I know you, you speak and you teach on your, the four pillars of finding his own genius. Is that what they just were? We mm -hmm. just went through. Yeah. 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 Can that we, just broke this down. Yeah. Exactly. Can we dive into them a bit more? Cause I'd really love for people to really, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause a lot of listeners are always come to this and the common question I get, it's like, how do I find like, especially people like, you know, our generation, it's like, I want to find my purpose. What's my meaning? What's my thing? Cause I actually mm -hmm. believe that we all have an individual coded thing in us uh to yeah. do something here that brings us that ultimate joy and if that's to be a freaking barista for the rest of your life if that brings you joy then that's it but i see so many people these days watching the guys with e-com and lambos and maseratis and all this shit thinking that's what they need to do but then they start building this life and it's like this grind and they're like oh i can't get there but instead of just finding what's you know really for them so can, i'd love to dive in and unpack this a bit more yeah yeah so you know, as you symbol, so I broke down those four pillars. And if you want me to unpack either any one of them a little bit more, you know, the first being your unique talents, second, your defining life moments, and third, key relationships, and fourth, values and passions. But what, what I've found is it's the accumulation of the clues for each of those categories that helps make the patterns pop. Think Jim Collins and Good to Great. Um, he's this famous, uh, have you read any of Jim Collins books? I haven't actually. Okay. No worries. Well, he's this famous, uh, entrepreneur author. Um, and he wrote some books like good to great built to last. And what he would do as he, his first quest was not to decide on what the solutions were and then go find evidence that supports the solutions or the hypothesis. He was like, Hey, I'm going to gather the data of what helped these companies go from good to great, or what helped these companies go from built to last. Like they've been around forever, it seems like. And what he found is that the patterns popped. They pop like popcorn when you gather enough of the data. And so what, I, what I've created basically is, is a most unique process for gathering all the data or the greatest accumulation of data about 
Morgan Nelson's genius or your genius, right? Like where you just do when you do the work, now you have to do the work. You can't just be a lazy bum sitting on your couch and hey, I'm gonna meditate and find my zone of genius. Probably not gonna happen. Sorry, guys. Um, I like meditation, that actually helps, but gather the clues, do the reflection, that heart. There's a reason the book is called Think and Grow Rich. Not grind and grow rich, not <laughs> law of attraction and grow rich, not get up at 5 a.m. and grow rich. Think. The hardest work we do as human beings is thinking. Where, where, where have you seen that people go wrong in their, in their thinking? Um, I think they, the first part is that they don't prioritize knowing themselves. And if, if I look at, you know, that Socrates quote, to know thyself is the beginning of all wisdom. Socrates is a pretty smart dude. He mentored Plato and Aristotle, who formed the basis of Western democracy. We don't have democracy if we don't have Plato and Aristotle. Okay. Um, next guy. Uh, most of us have used a Visa, debit, or credit card, right? You probably have a couple in your wallet. Listeners, probably a couple in your wallet. I talked to this guy. His name's D Hawk last year, founder of Visa. He's 98 years old at the time. He's still alive as of today, uh, to what I know. 99 years old. What did he do after he retired from Visa? What he did is he started researching the very best leaders in the world because he was still curious. He's like, hey, I still have something left to give. And curiosity drives genius. Curiosity drives breakthroughs. Curiosity drives major aha moments. Why was Einstein obsessed with human ad imagination and curiosity? Well, D and his research, and he started writing for Harvard Business Review. He found that the very best leaders in the world did something that normal leaders did not do over and over and over again. He found that they focused more than 50% of their leadership energy on leading themselves. So what's that mean for us? modern day young millennial entrepreneur, leader, creator, whatever, myself included. Am I leading myself into the right positions? Or am I playing the wrong position because I think I should do this? Or I think that's a cool, sexy, interesting idea. I saw someone else doing it and I got a little insecure or jealous or whatever. What's the right position for me? in that self-awareness, leading myself into the right position. And you look at the most successful men and women throughout any era, generally they put themselves in an extraordinarily right position for the time, for the market, for the industry, whatever they're in. Is there, is there a way for people to know if they're on this track or if they're off the track? Like what, what are some signals that happen in people's lives if they're completely mm. not operating in this space? Uh, good question. Failure is not, first of all, failure is not necessarily a signal that you're on the wrong track. And here's what I mean. Okay, sometimes we're like, ah, oh, I failed at that. That means, that means something might not have been completely right about that situation. But like, I have a seven month old little girl. She's crawling right now. She's going to start walking and attempting to walk probably in the next two months. When she starts walking, Morgan, if you're a good dad and your baby girl starts walking and she's trying to crawl and stumble and she falls and hits her face on the ground, are you going to kick her and say, stupid girl, quit, quit trying to walk? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. No, that'd be the wrong thing. Right. <laughs> but as us as leaders and adults, you know, what happens is, is we lose creativity Here's a crazy stat I read in uh, Kotler's book, The Art of Impossible. Um, in 1968, they did a study on human creativity and found that 98% of four and five-year-olds scored on the genius level of creativity. Down the other end of the spectrum, adults. Guess, guess how many, what the percentage was of adults that scored at the genius level of creativity? Out of, out of how many? Out of 100%. Out of 100%? No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What percent? Below 30? 2%. <laughs> 2%. So guess what? 
This four and five year old genius. By the time little Morgan gets to be grown up adult Morgan, no longer a genius. What happened? What happened to the genius that was showing so much promise? He got schooled out of him. He got drummed out of him. He got afraid of failure, afraid of making a mistake, afraid of trying something new because if I stumble and fall, I'm getting kicked. So fear, fear is the, the biggest thing that is numbing our creativity. Is that what you're saying? Because people don't want it. Like, why would I want to create if there's a possibility of screwing it up? Yeah, that's a part of it. And I, I think it's part of the middle class mindset and industrial age paradigm. Think about, think about our schools. And my mom was a school teacher for 30, year, 30 plus years. And I love teachers. I think teachers have one of the hardest jobs in the world. But guess also what the, they're also product and handcuffed by the system. Yeah. What's the system? My, at least in my upbringing, I don't know about your upbringing, but my school system was like, hey, we want you to at least be average at everything. Right. Right. Average at everything doesn't, that doesn't bring about genius. Einstein was not average at everything. He was freaking a badass at a few things. Tesla, badass at a few things. Elon Musk, dude, has relationship problems. Like, you know, he's had the same wife that's married and divorced him two or three times, mm. you know? <laughs> he's not, he, he, but he's a freaking genius at a few things. Yeah. Steve Jobs, genius at a few things. Oprah Winfrey, genius at a few things. So peak performers tend to find their genius and just lock in on it and not worry about, doesn't mean they don't gradually improve some of their weaknesses. They're a lot more focused on their strengths. Mm. And they don't, they don't, they don't let fear of failure hold them back. They, they see failure as growth. Yeah. This is so interesting because like, when I'm thinking back to school days, I sucked at English. I sucked at maths. In fact, they told me in English, they're like, when you finish school, don't do anything in journalism, reading or writing or speaking. Uh, cause it's definitely not up your alley. And I just wrote a book. I have a top podcast. I've spoken all around the world. Right. But it's, it's a, it's a yeah. right. It's an interesting thing. But the thing is like, I, I was, uh, you know, I left their school thinking that I was stupid for quite a while until I started getting around other yeah. people who I perceived as not very smart, but they were doing very well in life. And I changed the whole paradigm mm. of it. But I think it really comes down to, because in school, we start to build this belief that if we fail, we get punished, right? If we get failed, yeah. we, get in, we get in trouble. If we get a bad mark, you know, we're punished or we don't, pass or whatever there's some sort of punishment but then in the real world the more we fail the more we're rewarded so people come out of yeah. school going i don't want to fail i'm a fear of failure fear of failure where, where i i don't know about you but my shortcut to creating success in anything i i look for how can i fuck this up as fast as i possibly can so i can learn and collect data mm -hmm. as fast as i can right yeah so apart from the, forward faster yeah um so a, a, apart from the fear uh what else should people be aware of that might be killing their creativity? Cool. Good, good question. A couple of things, uh, life patterns. Um, I'm going to talk about those in a second and also whispers. We should pay attention to the whispers where, Oh, my soul was alive where I was like, I really enjoyed that. Even if I sucked at it, right? Like you probably at some point, a light bulb went on and you said, you know what? I may suck at writing or speaking or whatever right now. But I'm fascinated with, and that might have even driven you, the obstacle is a way to become great. But also you had this hunger and drive. Like I went to my first uh, seminar at age 19. My mom doesn't even remember buying me a ticket to the seminar. But I go to the success seminar about Peter Lowe, I hear guys like Zig Ziglar and others talk. And while I was there, I was like, you know what? I love this. I got so much from that day, from that one day. Then I go to another seminar when I was a junior in college, middle of finals week. I go to the seminar. I was like, man, I got more out of this one day than I got out of all semester. I was like, and I sucked as a public speaker. My attorney brothers made fun of me. They made fun of me for like just going long winded answers, which I guess I get to do on podcasts now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm doing this, uh, the, you know, I'm at this seminar and I'm like, man, I love this. I'm juiced by it. So when you're juiced and energized by something, that's also a whisper. When um, the other thing, what else snuffs out our genius? Um, 
uh, life patterns. If we look at our life patterns that, so I, I know there's three to four hours a day of peak emotional and mental energy. So what do I wanna do in those three to four hours? Do I wanna do administrative tasks that I hate doing that are roughly 20 to $50 an hour activities? Nope. I wanna do the things that I'm desperately needed for, the things that are like $1,000 or $10,000 an hour activities that could really make an impact. So that's what I wanna do during those windows. Mm-hmm. Like you wanna think about, hey, what, where is it that I'm most desperately needed that people need my gifts, my talents, and I can, I can make a, a high leverage impact in my life or career or relationship, whatever. Is there a certain time when it's reasonable to kind of kick that in? Like, for example, I have this conversation with my partner often, right? Because um, I say to her, I was, I was like, because I, I pay someone to come in and make all my meals for the week. I'm like, I yeah. don't want to do that. I hate cooking. It's a waste of my time to go to the shops to think about it. It's just, it's, that's a few hours of my life. I'd rather mm-hmm. pay somebody $25 an hour to do it. And, and then she's like, no, I'm just going to do it myself. And so we have this debate often. And I say to her, I was I'm like, you're worth so much more than that per hour. And she couldn't, yeah. uh, in the beginning, when we started to talk about it, I was like, you know, you could employ someone to do that. Then you can fill that time with doing something that either brings you joy or more money. I was like, because your time's actually worth more than that. But she's like, yeah, but if I, by me employing that person, it's still going to cost me that money, right? So she was really looking at like tangibly. So at what point does somebody really start to value their time like that? Like, is, is it the chicken or the egg sort of thing? Like, you know, is it, do you start to get paid your hourly worth when you treat it like that? Or do you have to start, is there a moment where you have to do these shitty things at the bottom for a while until you're making enough money? What, what do you think? Well, that's a great question. I love your example. You're thinking entrepreneurially. You're thinking, hey, all right, who, who, this is not a high value activity for me. It's something I need. I got to eat and I want to eat good. So um, we do the same thing. We have a meal service um, and, and it buys this time. I actually like to cook. I don't want to cook every night. So I'm My the wife exact doesn't same. want to cook every night. Yeah. I'm yeah. like one, one night a week's I, good. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Saturdays <laughs> on Sabbath, I might cook. Maybe that's, if I'm lucky, I may, yeah, may not. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, so you think entrepreneurially because I want to buy back time. What do the wealthy do? Why do the wealthy take, why do they have drivers? You know, if, if you go to London or Paris or New York City, you know, where did Uber's black car service came from? come from, right? It came from the executives the diplomats, what happens when you look around those big cities, you see black Mercedes five series sitting outside of a lot of important buildings. They're on call. They're waiting for the executive because the executive's time is worth thousands of dollars an hour. He doesn't need to be doing a 20 or $30 an hour activity Mm -hmm. because it also creates fatigue, mental decision, fatigue, things like that. And, um, so you, uh, I like to look, compare it to middle class mindset, where it's, I'm going to DIY it so that I save money or a billionaire mindset. They're they're obsessed with protecting their decision making fatigue mm. and protecting like Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, two goals every single day. Do you know what his goals are every day? No. Make two smart strategic decisions. Wow. That's it. Everything else is secondary to that. Right. So yeah, why did Steve Jobs wear black turtlenecks all the time? It's just less decisions to make. I've heard that one, right? Is that it? Uh, uh-huh. yeah. yeah. Protecting his decision-making energy. Yeah. Right. Because we only got so many decisions we can make before our mind starts hitting fatigue. And if I'm making decisions on small things, mm. it's going to be a struggle. Is, is it the same for everybody or is, or is this, this, so like is there a way to increase your decision making fatigue or is it just like this cap limit sort of for everybody i've never heard of that yeah yeah you can you can increase your decision making energy and there's things that reboot us right and there's things you can do to deplete it all right getting bad sleep um or lots of alcohol that's gonna or even uh marijuana right i i like cbd i do not like thc here's why it actually weakens your brain 
And this comes from one of the top biohackers, Dave Asprey. It, it screws things up in your brain a little bit. Um, you can do things like, um, uh, I do take a lot of nootropics. Are you familiar with nootropics? Yeah. So, that, you know, brain focusing supplements and, and foods, um, paying attention to foods like fried foods, French fries. I like French fries. We have an air fryer at our house. So we put the air fryer in, it doesn't have any of that crappy oil that makes, that actually is like cancer to your brain mm. and creates brain fog. There's foods, habits that induce brain fog. You look like a fit dude. Do you work out a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you go and get a good workout in, not a workout to where you're the point of you're vomiting and you're about, you're just got to go take a nap afterwards, but a good workout actually resets your energy patterns. Okay. There's, there's four energy quadrants in your life, emotional, mental, physical, and uh, spiritual. Um, if you create energy exertion, energy renewal, exert, mm -hmm. renew, because you're a human being, not a machine. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of Which sense. The, uh, yeah. Because I, I used to do CrossFit quite a bit until I really started to ramp up like my new business and everything like that. And then I just got to the point, I was like, I, I literally, I can't train CrossFit every day. Cause if I, I work my ass, I like my health's great. I get really ripped. I put on weight and you know, I feel strong. However, my brain is just dead for about two hours after. And so I, I've, yeah. I've stopped doing CrossFit. And when I go to the gym, I, I train, I honestly push myself to about 80%. And sometimes mm -hmm. the, the PTs are in there and, and they're like, you can go heavier today. I said, I know I can do a lot heavier, but I don't know. I don't want to. Like I'm not working out yeah. to try and win Mr. Olympia here. I'm working out just to keep my body moving, keep in shape and, you know, stay healthy. And I, I've, it's such, I've never even heard about this before you're talking about, it, but it makes a lot of sense. Cause there's some days that if I do push harder, I come back feeling a little bit crapper. But if I find this happy medium, like today, all I did was 30 minutes cardio and I actually feel extremely mm -hmm. energized today. So I've felt like yeah. I, I was like, I might start to throw this in my, my routine once or twice a week, right? Just do cardio. Uh, where I'm not exerting all my strength because I, I feel just so sharp today. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens is, I don't know if you noticed, like I, I tend to do my workouts at the end of the day. And here's why. Because I want, when we wake up in the morning, and when do you do your workouts? Morning or evening? I do in the morning because otherwise I just don't make the time in the afternoon. Yep. Yeah. And a lot of people are that way. And it's yeah. important to get a workout in. And so, um, because it's, it's the foundation of, of, of your, your, everything else, yeah. uh, your physical health. And, and here's a crazy thing. Most people don't know this about Da Vinci. You know what da, Vin da Vinci believed in the seven types of, uh, a friend of mine wrote the book, how to think like Leonardo da Vinci, which, uh, sold like 800,000 copies. Uh, I can get him on your podcast, by the way, too, if you yeah, want Michael cool. Gelb is in his name, but what he found is that da Vinci had this ha like he was one of the most prolific geniuses of all time, right? You know what he would do every year? I mean, every day. He would work out his body too, because he found it affected his other quadrants of his genius, other parts of his thinking, his emotions, and they would get all and the energy realms would get out of balance, basically. And so now I do my workouts at the end of the day because I find um, it's a good separation for me, like shifting from work mode to play mm -hmm. mode. And it also reboots me. It like clears out that it balances the energy field again, clears me out. So now I can be present with my wife, et cetera, sleep better, all those things. And I love, I love, love, love those first three hours. Like I wrote my book, this book here, Genius Within. I wrote it in typically between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m., in the morning, one month. It took me a little over a month because my wife was pregnant um, and she was going to bed at like 9.40 and 10 o'clock. And I was like, all right, I'll just go to bed with you and I'll get up at like 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah. And instead of doing this prolonged morning routine, I'd do about 20 or 30 minutes of just getting my body moving, nootropics, matcha latte, uh, meditation, focus, what I'm, what my affirmation, I jump right into writing and creating. Because guess what? At the beginning, my mind is clearest, is sharpest. I want pay attention tomorrow when you wake up. Notice how clear your mind is, especially if you don't check your email and check your Instagram and check all the things. If you just leave those things off, stay in airplane mode, 
your mind's going to be clear and refreshed and on point. Mm. This, That's your I, best I, thinking time. I'd love to hear what, what is your morning routine? Cause this, this thing I'm, I'm huge on it. Like I can literally pinpoint such a huge shift in my life in productivity and happiness. Mm -hmm. The moment I actually started to sleep with my phone on airplane mode and just write yeah. down gratitudes in the morning, something as simple as that uh, and having that time in the morning. But, um, what, what, what do you do to kick off your day? Uh, to kick off my day, I'll stand up and I'll, uh, I'll play typically within the first, um, I'd say 300 out of 365 days, I will play within the first 10 minutes of being up. Um, I'll get a glass of water, splash my face with cold water. Um, I'll maybe move, do like 10 burpees. I won't do much of a workout, but I'll do something to get my body moving, a little energy. Maybe sometimes I'll do 25, 30 kettlebell swings. So that really helps. I should do those more often, frankly. And then I'll do my affirmations for two minutes. Um, and I have them recorded here. I'll play uh, a couple minutes of them. And the reason, it, or not a couple minutes, a few seconds, the affirmations, do you do affirmations yet or incantations as Tony calls I've, them? I've done a lot in the past. I'll honestly admit my morning routine has been, I've just fallen off it the last, I actually did a story about it yesterday. It's super funny. It's like I've, I've been so hard on it for maybe six years, five years straight. And I've seen awesome results. And it's, I don't know what happened. Just like in my head a few months ago, I was like, well, you've already gotten here. You don't have to do much anymore. You know what I mean? And I, and then I've just noticed it lately. I'm waking up and I feel a little bit crappy. And then literally the, this last week I'm, I'm back in it. So I usually, I write down gratitudes and I write down three, uh, yeah, three affirmations, three present tense uh, goals. So I am cool. this, I have done this, this is done. So this is my three primary focuses. Love it. Yeah, those are good too. Um, now, I, I like to declare them and I like to also declare where you're going. And there's a reason, like you want to also say them in powerful present tense, like Muhammad Ali. Do you know much about his story? A little bit, a little bit. All right. So he was born, Cassius Clay was his name. And he, before he fought the World Heavyweight Championship, he created a poem. He was a seven to one odds against like losing. Like everyone, he was a massive underdog uh, against this guy named Sonny Liston. And he uh, created this poem called, I am the greatest. Go listen to it on uh, YouTube. It's freaking okay. amazing. It's about three minutes long. And, and at the beginning, the crowd is jeering him. It's almost like you could imagine if they had tomatoes and potatoes, they would be throwing them at him. But because he believed it and he declared it with such energy and conviction, guess what? Literally within about 40 seconds of his, of his poet, um, poem, the crowd is like excited and they're enthused and they now believe it. Wow. All right. And, and because he declared it. So when you get up in the morning with as much energy as possible, um, but I do the affirmations because guess what? In the morning, I usually don't feel like it and I don't feel like I'm as powerful as I want to be. Yeah. So I want to declare where I'm going and who I am. So here's, here's the beginning. I'll just play the yep. first 15 yeah. seconds, maybe. I am Magic Mike. I am a wealth magnet. I am attracting, earning, and saving millions of dollars. I am worthy of extraordinary levels of success. I am a powerful force for good. I am America's top entrepreneur mentor. So I'm proclaiming where I want to go. I'm not, I haven't achieved all those things yet. But I, I also have an alter ego there too, a magic mic, because when I went through a season of loss where I lost uh, over a million dollars, I was like ashamed. And I wanted to tuck my tail between my legs. I'm like, hey, this same identity, the same mindset that I'm feeling right now is not gonna get me out of this. Mm. And then I had a client, she was a doctor. Uh, I was creating some beautiful shifts in her, in her life. And she said, you're magic Mike. You, are, you created magic in my life. She's Asian and she had this just sweet, funny accent. And, uh, and I was like, boom, that's it. I'm Magic Mike. Create magic in people's lives and businesses. So anyway, 
the alter ego is another psychological trick um, that you want to use on yourself. Like, what is your, you know, uh, Beyonce? We've all heard of Beyonce. What's her alter ego? Sasha Fierce. She gets on stage, boom. She's in Sasha Fierce mode. She is going to be a performer, star, own the stage. She, she grew up as a church choir girl. She doesn't, dance, church choir girls don't dance like that. Mm. Yeah, this is so fascinating because it's like it, it, it really is that. And I say to some people often, um, I, I, I get, but Morgan, I wish I could do that, but I'm just not that confident. I said, if you were confident, how would you just act? Like, could you just try it? Mm-hmm. Like, could you just pretend that you are now? Like, act yeah. as someone who's confident. And then they do it. I'm like, that's so fascinating. So, <laughs> like, could, can you just pretend to be that sin? Like, what, what is the actual difference there, right? And then eventually it's starting to... Um, it's such a fascinating, fascinating thing that we can do with our own minds there. Yeah. And, and now you want to be careful a little bit. If you just, if it feels like a lie, then, then like too much of like, I believe all those things are true and becoming true for me. But if, if I felt like it was too much of a stretch, then, and it wasn't something I was truly capable of at my highest level, then I would want to change them. And, and reframe them to it's like I am becoming mm. like if it felt too congruent, I would say I am becoming America's top entrepreneur mentor. Mm. So but it, it's whatever you you want that I am is the most powerful and you eliminate what I call weak ass words like try hope to would love to you know what people use I would love to do that someday. What's that really mean? I will never get to it. But it sounds really nice. Yeah. Yes. Um, man, this, this has been amazing. Um, I, I, I want to, I want people to really understand the importance of those. Cause I don't talk about it enough. Those incantations you have in the morning, I have done them for years. And I, I remember even a thing, uh, a little while ago, I was going through this whole thing. Cause like I'm 28 now. Right. And I created cool success doing this shit. Yeah. 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 A young age. And I kind of thought I was like, I'm confident. I've built confidence. And then for a little mm. while, a couple of years back, I was struggling with this internal thing. I was like, what's, what's this feeling? What's going on here? And I was like, ah, oh, I didn't know that there was a difference between self-confidence and self-love. I was like, so I would put my self-esteem down and be more confident thinking that was the winning thing. So then once I figured that out, I was like, okay, what's the fastest way for me to start to embody this? And I remember I used to go to sleep at night playing affirmations on my phone. I put it under my pillow and sleep with it over and over and over and over. And within literally weeks, I started to notice a shift in internally inside of me. And now I've gone on to study hypnotherapy and, and all this sort of stuff. And I understand really what's happening inside of our mind now. So could you please just explain to people a bit about the importance of and like what, like, because sometimes people might hear this. I remember the first time I saw affirmations, I was like, that sounds a bit dicky, right? It's like, wh- why does this work? <laughs> like what's happening in the human brain for this to be so powerful to do? And first thing in the morning. Mm. And the reason, because you, most of us wake up not feeling like it. Yeah. Most of us wake up, uh, like, I don't wake up and feel like I'm going to conquer the world, but I'm like, our bodies, if you let your feelings dictate your future, and what dictates our future by dictating your day, because all you have to live is today, right? So you want to you direct where you're going, your feelings, your emotions, your body, etc., based on your what you really want. And our words have power. Uh, so much is burst into life by words. Think of it like let's look at some of our most powerful people in the world. Oprah Winfrey. She declared she wanted to have her own television network. She did it. Right? It starts Muhammad Ali wrote that poem about I am the greatest heavyweight champion the world has ever seen. When you go and listen to it, he wrote that eight months before he became heavyweight champion at age 22. Eight months before. Not after. He didn't wait. Hey, like, hey I hope to become world heavyweight champion of the world. He said, this is where I'm going. So, and he knew. He knew he might fail. Like he, I, I've read one of his autobiographies. I'm reading another one as well. And guess what? He knew he would... There was a chance he would fail, but because he declared it, he committed. He committed to doing what it takes to get there. He knew it may not happen immediately. He knew it wasn't going to be easy. He knew he wasn't going to uh, walk without stumbling. 
So our words are birthing creations, both negatively and positively. And some of us are sloppy. We are so sloppy with our words, words we speak over ourselves, words we speak over others, words we speak over our children, our loved ones, etc. So one of my quests to unlock human genius is also, how do we be more intentional and more careful and more powerful with our words? I love it. I love it, Mike. This has been insane and uh we a hundred percent have to run back another episode we'll, we'll do i know we can go dive we, great, we can right? dive deep in so many areas but um where, where can everybody find you get your book and check out everything that you're doing right now yeah a couple a couple areas on any of the social media i'm at the mike zeller and that's zeller z-e-l-l-e-r uh instagram tiktok linkedin and facebook um youtube etc um then uh the book geniuswithinbook.com the uh it's just www.thegeniuswithin or geniuswithinbook.com not no the in it and you can get the book for free if you're in the states um if you're overseas you have to pay a little extra shipping and handling um of course at amazon uh and anywhere else books are sold you can usually get it um and then the other thing i would say is if you well i guess if you're in overseas most of your listeners are overseas i'll just cut that wait, out. Wait, we actually <laughs> we're in 60 countries so a, a large portion okay. are still in the states north america uh but a big majority here in australia as well yeah okay well, and if you're in the States, you can text the number 474747, text the word genius you to 474747. You'll get my six steps to find your genius, which I'll share the link as well for the show notes. Yeah. Epic. Mike, this has been incredible. Okay. Um, to, to wrap this up, I've got one final question for you. Are you ready? Uh oh. What is it? <laughs> if you were to go back to your 18 year old self and give him 30 seconds of advice, what would it be? go for it people care a lot less about you than you think you're going to be judged one way or another whether you do it or not might as well just go for it choose your path without inhibition